Welcome to the Interaccess YouTube channel, Interaccess.io. Today we're going to talk about uh, a company slash blockchain, Figure and Provenance. So what happened was Figure is a company that is looking, it was founded by Mike Cagney, who's one of the founders of SoFi, and they're looking to kind of upset or disrupt the, the lending market and the digital asset, the, the securities market, because what they see as a lot of bloat, a lot of excess fees, a lot of excess friction that takes place because of the, the old traditional financial system, and they see a way that the blockchain technology, the digital ledger or, or decentralized ledger technology can actually help with this and, and take out some of those excessive fees and some of that excessive friction, and they want to use blockchain technology. So what they did was they basically created their own blockchain that they call Provenance. Now the reason why they created their own built on top of Hyperledger is because they wanted to make sure that it worked for exactly the, the right purposes for the, the kind of for the banking world, for the, the, the traditional finance players to be able to uh, do things within that system without being bogged down by a lot of the complete public blockchain uh, issues that, that bog down potentially public blockchains, all right? Because they wanted people who were in the financial industry or understand the financial industry to be able to use it. So they created provenance. So we'll talk a little bit about the provenance blockchain that was built on top of the Hyperledger uh, consensus, uh, on top of the Hyperledger blockchain system. So what is uh, provenance? Or, or basically, why did they create it? They created it because there's a, there's a lot of bloat in the system. And some of that example is, let's say that I want to get a, uh, a mortgage, okay, and I go, I want to go to my bank, I want to get a loan, I have to, I have to fill out an app, I have all these, um, all this documentation that I need to, to give them, uh, I pay some fees, et cetera, and someone, the underwriter or the issuer, or wh whatever, uh, will read all this and decide if I actually get that mortgage. Okay, they, they'll say, and, and then they'll give the terms, right? The terms are interest rate, um, length, uh, wh whether there's a prepayment penalty, all these things. So now, he, here's my mortgage, and they keep, you know, the, obviously all the paperwork and some sort of filing cabinet. Hopefully, they digitize everything now. If they want to go sell that mortgage, because many times they will go sell that mortgage to another party, another servicer, that servicer has to look across all the data and look at all the paperwork and the documentation and make sure it fits with what they want. And then there's a big process, and they sell it, and there are a lot of fees involved in that. They and then someone might create a security on on top of that. They might package up a whole bunch of mortgages just like mine into one big, um, one big security and, issue, and they have to create a trust and then they have to issue shares in the trust to create the security and sell that to investors. So it's a whole big mess and it, it creates hundreds of billions of dollars a year in excess fees and excess friction because of all these processes and they, and they kind of want to try to get down some of those fees and get down some of those friction and blockchain is perfect. And why is, is blockchain technology perfect for this? Because one, it can be distributed, right? So blockchain technology can be distributed. It is also immutable, right? That's one of the best cases of, of the blockchain, it's immutable. So basically what happens when I have this mortgage, everything that, that's included in it and everything that has happened, all the payments I've made, um, the, the principal, the appraisal of my home and everything, it goes in there and it can't ever be changed. So it's, it's nice, it, everything that's happened, whether it's moved from, one, from the first underwriter to another company that services, put it in security, whatever it is, all of that is, is always there for anyone to see in, in the database that is the blockchain. And it's also trustless. Okay, that means that everyone who's a part of this, they don't necessarily have to trust each other. So, one, so the, the seller, someone selling my mortgage doesn't have to trust the buyer. The buyer doesn't have to trust the seller because all the data, they can see all the data on the blockchain. They can just look and see everything about my mortgage. They don't have to trust each other at all. They get to see everything. They don't have to trust that the data was right. The data was right when it was put in the blockchain. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been put there. So what kind of data is there? Well, there's registry, right? Registry says who, 
who owns my home, who initiated this loan, all the information about me, who, who has title, all those things, that's part of the, the registry. Then you have the ledger. The ledger keeps track of the payments that I've made, um, how, how that affects my ownership versus the bank's ownership or versus the mortgage servicer's ownership. That's all the ledger. How has this mortgage changed hands? What all has happened to this home and this particular loan on this home uh, in the time that, that this loan has been issued, this mortgage has been issued? And then there's the exchange, right? And the exchange says, uh, again, the ability for this mortgage, the particular income that comes with it and the ownership and everything that goes along with it, the title and all that, can now be traded. And why can it be traded? Because you know who owns it, you know what has happened, and you can, you can kind of trust all that because it's being done on a blockchain and sitting in the middle is the provenance blockchain. And that's what they've done. Figure created this blockchain specifically for these types of purposes because that's what a blockchain is really good at. So they went out and said, look, we're not going to wait for a public blockchain to do it. We're just going to do it. We're going to create it the way we think it needs to be done. So how do they do that? Well, first, they, they created and, and they did it on Hyperledger, but they created and minted a token called Hash. Okay, and so some of the early investors were, they, they invested money and they get hash in return. And hash is the token. There won't ever be any more tokens. I think there are 100 billion of them that were issued, or that were created, and there won't be any more. So the original investors want their hash tokens to go up. Now, hash tokens are not traded on an exchange or anything, uh, so, so far as I know. And, and here's why they're used, because what you have is the provenance administrator, right, which at the beginning was figure, but they've, they've um, they're kind of handing over that ability to an independent third party. So you have the provenance administrator, and the administrator is deciding who gets to be members, right? And you get to be a member by being someone who can either initiate loans, wholesale loans, which means you can buy a whole bunch of them, you can back the loan, right? So if there's an underwriter, if there's someone who's really good at issuing loans for homes or for cars or student loans or whatever, they're really good at the underwriting, they can go do the underwriting, they can issue the loan, and then they have to go to another wholesaler behind them and say, hey, I just issued five loans for $10,000 each. You know I'm really good at this. Can you front me the money so that I can give all those people their money and, I, and, and I'll give you the income and I'll keep a little cut? That's kind of how the, the wholesaling works. So those are the members. So the members are going to be people who are good at underwriting, who are wholesaling, who securitize loans, anything like that. Those are the members uh, of, this, uh, of, of this group of the Providence blockchain. Now, you also have what's called the omnibus banks. And the omnibus banks are the ones who are helping us go from fiat currency into the blockchain world, into kind of the crypto world. So what happens is dollars or fiat money is gonna go in here and the omnibus banks are gonna create, are going to kind of convert it into hash and then put all, all the data on the blockchain. So all the, the transactions within the provenance blockchain are gonna be done using hash, using this cryptocurrency. But we as the users, me as the person getting the mortgage or getting the home loan or getting the, the car loan, it doesn't matter to me. I'm giving dollars. The dollars are going into the bank and being converted to cash before uh, anyone gets on the, the provenance blockchain. And then you have the nodes, right? And the nodes are over here. And they're the ones keeping the, basically holding the network, keeping the chain. And they're all, by base, based on their consensus algorithm, they're all agreeing with what's going on and they're keeping the whole network. Currently, these are um, financial institutions um, such that, that they're, you know, some of the big issuers of some of these loans, so it's in their best interest to be part of this system. And a lot of times they invested in this and, and they got hash in return. So they actually get fees, they get paid hash for essentially being these nodes for keeping track of this whole system. But because it's a blockchain, no one node gets to exert any sort of outward pressure or outward power on the chain. Everyone has to agree and, and agree to this consensus. And it's in everyone's best interest because um, there, there might be members that are part of the, the same companies that are the nodes, there might be members that are not, but it's in all their best interest to keep this economy, to, to keep all this moving forward, to keep all these financial instruments moving, and, and for everyone to have this transparency and this ability to look 
um, at the immutability and look at all these different um, mortgages, look at all these loans, look at all these financial instruments, these securities, whatever they might be, it's in their best interest for it to be transparent and trustless, and it's not in anyone's real interest to exert any sort of outward pressure or power over the, the chain. So where is, is provenance being used? So uh, as an example, again, I'll go back to this idea of my mortgage. Let's say I'm going to get a mortgage. Now there might be some member, and we'll, we'll call that uh, the, you know, bank one who says, okay, Adam, we're going to get all your application. We're going to make sure, you know, you're, you're good here. And this member has already been approved by the provenance admin. So the member gets all my information, approves a loan, okay, and then my money that I pay has to go into the omnibus, has to go through the omnibus bank. It creates hash here so that all the information about my loan, so we'll call it Adam's mortgage, can go into the, the provenance blockchain now, okay? It, it's on the chain and it's sitting basically with all these nodes. So the inf all the information about my mortgage is there sitting on all these nodes. Anyone who's a part, a, a member, and, and has the authority can see what's going on with my loan. Now they might privatize it enough that they don't know my name and social security number and such, but they might know uh, a little bit about my payment history, my credit score when I started, my current credit score, my insurance, all of that. So now what happens is this member you know, has gotten paid, the fiat currency, the dollars have gone into the omnibus bank who gets paid a little bit for doing that. All the information has, has gone on to this blockchain. Now what happens is let's say this member wants to sell it, sell my mortgage to another member. Well that other member, we'll say it's down here, so this member can just look at the information that's sitting on this chain and decide whether they want to buy it. They don't have to trust each other at all. They might, he might just put this information out there within the provenance uh, exchange and say, who wants to buy this? And this person can say, hey, I can see that this person has a high credit score and, and um, good payment history, and I like where the house is located, and I like the appraisal, and I want to buy it. And they don't have to know anything about me. They don't have to know anything about this member. They never have to have done business before. My mortgage can now go from my payments going to this member, and now my payments are going to go to this member just like that. And the, the registry, the, everything has changed. The ledger has changed. Um, this member now kind of owns that loan, all the income stream goes to them, and all the transaction, the time, the fees, the friction that are usually involved in making that exchange have almost all disappeared because of the fact that everything about my mortgage is transparent to these members here. They can see everything about it. Now, so, so that's one area where they're, they're solving a lot of costs. Let's say that this member down here buys a bunch of mortgages, right? Of course. So they, they buy a bunch of mortgages. Well. And apologies. They buy a bunch of mortgages. One, two, three, four, whatever. Okay, and they want to create a security out of them. Now, why might they want to do that? Because now I, now, you know, member five over here might go, look, I have, in, instead of just wanting to buy one mortgage, I want to buy a whole bunch because I want to create an income stream for myself. So I'm willing to give you, you know, five million dollars and I'll buy all these mortgages and what I get in return is I get, you know, the, the income stream, right? Now, member five can see all the mortgages that are in there. This member packages them all in a security. They basically can create a trust. This is how it works. They can create a trust and they issue trust shares to member five. And member five now owns the, the income stream from all of those. Now, all this can be done because member five can see all the individual mortgages that are part of that security. That security can have what's called a QCIP number. It can have all these things that, but they don't have to go through all the paperwork and everything else and, and all the, the trust and everything else that's involved in usually create, going from all these mortgages, bundling them up, 
getting all the data, all the information, all the pertinent stuff, putting them in a trust, selling the trust shares, issuing the trust shares, which is a whole other security, all the, the same issues with issuing a mortgage is issuing, a, uh, issuing the trust certificates, all of those fees can be minimized because we have so much transparency. So now this security, right? So security one, I, I apologize for the spaghetti bowl we got going on here, but that's what they're trying to solve, right? Security one is now tracked on the Providence blockchain. So all these nodes agree, Security One has all these mortgages. By the way, all the information on all these mortgages is also on our database. So it is so easy to track everything and the ease of use and the ease of tracking and the ease of putting all these within a security, which is also on this blockchain and making all of that immutable and transparent and trustless and distributed. The fact that all these nodes agree on it means that this financial ecosystem can keep going forward without anyone really having to trust each other. So I can maybe decide at one point, I want to be a member. I go get all the certifications I need to be a, a money transfer business, whatever I need to do to lend money. And I can be really good at underwriting for some certain purposes. Maybe I want to underwrite people that need to buy laptop computers to do uh, some sort of marketing work. And I've gotten really good at that because I know those people well, now I can use the Provenance blockchain to, to do that. Now, and, and I can then, you know, eventually um, track all those using this. I can eventually sell a security, sell a bond, what, whatever it might be, based on my underwriting history, based on the fact that I now know how to do that. And I don't have to have that much of the technology behind me because I just build it on top of the, the Provenance blockchain. So what has happened now is, I hopefully will erase all of this. and figure it has, you know, since they were the ones that created this originally, they launched a, a home equity line of credit HELOC product that essentially says we can fast track a lot of information to get people their home equity line of credit because we're, we're using this chain, because we're using this system we've already built and they processed over a billion dollars of HELOCs uh, within a very short amount of time. And now those, those home equity lines of credit are able to be uh, securitized, be basically put into securities, they can be sold, whatever, the, they, whatever needs to happen for minimal costs, minimal transaction fees, minimal fees and friction. That's really important. So now other companies are actually able to build on top of the provenance blockchain. So what happens to this hash, this token, is all those nodes they, that's how they get paid, and they hope that the value goes up. Remember, there are only, only I say only, 100 billion hash tokens ever created. Well, hash is what's used. Those omnibus banks convert dollars into hash, and all the, the members and, and the, the nodes, everyone kind of gets to decide, here's what we're going to charge for our fees, and we're going to charge it in hash. So the more, um, the, the more uh, interest, the more use there is of the provenance blockchain, the more valuable the hash tokens are going to be because there's a, there's a finite amount of them and they're going to have to be used in exchange because we convert dollars into hash and then hash is used within the provenance blockchain to make transactions so that there's not dollars that have to go back and forth among different banks. It's just hash that's going back and forth on the blockchain to denote these transactions and then those omnibus banks are converting fiat to hash and hash back into fiat. So we don't have to worry about other blockchains. We don't have to worry about going to Ethereum or Tezos or Bitcoin or any of the other blockchains. They're doing it all within their own and they're able to easily track all the data that's involved in a particular loan or a particular security. It doesn't have to be a loan, it could be just about any security. They're able to track all that data and able to track the money that goes back and forth based on, on using hash. Now what will happen uh, eventually is you will, you will have other uh, security tokens, probably uh, other digital assets that are created on this uh, blockchain and then there will be kind of DeFi applications that are based on that. So again, I might have my security token used as uh, collateral because someone might see that I, I own a particular asset that, that has been created uh, and denoted on the, the provenance blockchain. And then they say, we're comfortable, we actually issue debt 
on the Provenance blockchain, we can have this collateral be uh, used to, to issue debt, and now I might get a loan based on some collateral I own, some real estate potentially that I own, and all the, the, the data is on the provenance blockchain. We can see that happening. We can see provenance being used to easily in like supply chain, right? In supply chain financing, in trade finance, where people might get 30, 60, 90, 120 day payment terms, and you can very easily use the provenance blockchain so that most people can go from fiat use fiat currency, um, but with these omnibus banks and the Providence blockchain, they're actually able to use fiat currency, but not always have to move money back and forth among different banks. We can use this chain to actually reduce a lot of the fees and friction, and there might be some new players that get in that game, or some of the players that are involved in trade finance are going to see this, and they're going to start building on top of Providence instead of whatever other antiquated system they have in the traditional finance system, and they're, they're going to be the players because they're going to say, look, we, we can cut down the fees that we charge for borrowing money or lending money or handling that trade finance at 30, 60, 90, 120 day trade finance. That's where we can see it happening. So again, Figure came out with their home equity line of credit. They're coming out with a lot of other uh, financial service type offerings. And, and remember, and they built the Providence blockchain. Now they've since, again, offloaded the, the admin ability so that they're not in bed too much together so you don't feel like Figure can can arbitrarily exert any sort of power over the Providence blockchain that hurts everyone else, because that'll, of course, hurt it. But the idea was not to necessarily use a public blockchain for this, but to essentially create a permissioned blockchain where all these nodes uh, can see, and no one really has the incentive to exert any excess power. But they're utilizing the blockchain technology, the fact that it's distributed, immutable, trustless, all those things, for, for what the, the blockchain technology is best for. So they're, they're able to move around uh, registered items on a ledger. They're able to create exchanges and such uh, because they built this blockchain specifically for this purpose because they have so much expertise in the digital e or in lending that they're able to create a chain that actually works perfectly for, for this use case. And it's a, it's a multi-trillion dollar use case. So of course, uh, it's, it's well worth it. So that's a little bit about the Providence blockchain. It's a permission blockchain. And Figure, the company that actually built it and is now utilizing it for some of their own applications. So we hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Check us out on Twitter, at Interaxis8, uh, the number eight. Um, we, we have some more courses. We have some more membership. We have a membership uh, website coming out soon specifically for financial professionals, financial advisors, bankers, real estate professionals, so you can go in depth and learn some of these topics that we've been talking about, understand how it affects your industry, your clients and such. We'll have tools for you there, so check that out coming up soon and uh, subscribe. We hope to see you in the next video.